And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Deborah Freeman, an evidential psychic medium who had two near-death experiences, and today we're going to learn about them. Deborah, thank you so much for being my guest, and welcome. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. I'm quite excited. All right. If you don't mind, Deborah, can we just start on the day that your first one happened and go from there? Sure, sure. Um, I was a, eight years old, almost nine years old, and I was swimming. And I was in, I grew up in Burlington, Connecticut. So there on Kobe Lane down the end, there was a swimming pond many years, moons ago. We won't tell you how many moons ago, but many moons ago. And um, so when I was younger, I always knew someone was beside me when I was alone. And I always had the feeling of not being alone, but not understanding it. So anyways, so I was swimming. I must have, I know that summer I was nine. So I was out, they had a man-made pond. And we used to, when we grew up, I mean, we had ponies and horses and it was, wasn't uncommon to be nine years old and riding your bike by yourself. And it wasn't uncommon to ride your horses on that environment we grew up in. So there was a town um, pond and it was a recreation center and it had lifeguards and it had a floating dock, meaning that there was styrofoam, probably about, I'd say like eight, 12 to 18 inches and it was framed with wood and it had that fake turf on it and so they anchored it because it was a brown pond they anchored it with a chain and cinder blocks that's how they did it so it would shift well i jumped off and i was alone i was swimming down there i think i went down for swim lessons and then afterwards it was open swim and it wasn't uncommon to pay i think it was like 75 cents you know and stay there and swim afterwards so i was swimming and i was on the dock and i jumped off and All of a sudden, when I went down, the dock went over my head. And I had this feeling of, oh, what's going on? Before I realized what was happening, which I really didn't understand as a child, what was happening in that moment. And the dock went over, I was under the water and I was pushing up and I couldn't couldn't feel anywhere out. All I could feel was up that the dock was above me. And all of a sudden the water was cooler And all of a sudden I became very still. I had no burning. I had no choking. I had no, I didn't have any panic. I was very, very still. And I just remember before I felt what I felt and saw, this is not okay. That's all I felt. That's the only type of fear I had. And then I had a calming that I wasn't alone. And then I felt a warmth all around me. And I didn't see, I, truthfully, I didn't know if I saw the light from the edge of the water, meaning underneath it to the edge of the dock, because it was a sunny day where it was above me. I had no concept of where I was under that dock, like if I was in the middle, if I was on the side. And so I saw something shiny. I can't even say it was a bright light. It was more like a yellowish shine. And I felt surrounded, warm, a warmth. And I just felt warm water all over me. And I don't know the amount of time that I was under there. And the next thing I knew, I was feeling calm and I was being moved like in the water. I was just being shifted. And I opened my eyes. I was on the side of the dock. And I'm like, why is anybody helping me? That was my next reaction. Why wasn't anybody, you know, hello i could hear kids i could hear the lifeguard blowing the whistle i could hear kids laughing that was it and so i was not choking i didn't get frightened i was just a little confused like what happened and i didn't understand it because i didn't know what a near-death experience was at that age i was not raised um with a i was not tended to Like I said, we could ride our horses, we could take our bikes. It was a different environment and different than how we raised our children. And, but it was more of, um, I wasn't even frightened, but I remember getting out of the water, waiting there a minute. And then I swam, you know, because it was deep. I had to swim. I swam back to the side. I got my towel, I dried off, I felt tired. And then I waited like 15 minutes and I got on my bike and I went home. 
And that was my first experience that I can identify what it is now. Then I just knew I wasn't alone and I knew I was okay. And I was confused why I wasn't, I didn't have burning, choking, you know, I wasn't frightened. I, I understood that that should have been part of it, but I wasn't alone all the way home. Now, did you say that before even this happened, you always felt like you weren't alone? I did. I, I, I knew I wasn't alone. When I was about four, my sister is two years older. And so she's six and she had, um, she had some medical issues and when she was born. And so she was more um, looked upon, I'll put it that way. And then I had a little brother, he was seven years younger, but this is before my brother was born. And I just remember sitting and not playing with an imaginary friend. I just knew somebody was beside me coming and going, but I couldn't really see them, who they were. I just knew there was someone beside me. And as the layers go in my life and understanding I know they've always been with me. They've never left my side. And I've identified through life experience, the near, the other near-death experience, um, which that one is even flukier um, than the other. I should have drowned, to be totally honest. I was a young child. Um, I, I, the, it's amazing when I look at it removed as a mother you know, thinking of like a nine-year-old little girl under a dock and it, it, it just, it, it's overwhelming. So, but it's a layer. So I, so going through life and going through these near-death experiences, I can identify them as that, but I don't look at them without looking at who's always beside me and who I can, who I've been able to identify and what I've been able to identify has always been beside me. And it's more experiences as, as we go. Um, I've had some, do you want me to explain the next one or do you have some more questions for that? Oh, well, so are you saying that with that experience that confirmed it for you that you had I didn't understand it. You still I didn't, didn't understand, understand it even. Well, I even, was too little. I was okay. too little. Like I was the, I was the little girl that um, like we went to CCD but it was to make our Holy Communion and we didn't do anything more than that. It was, I wasn't raised in a strict religious environment. I wasn't supported in a um, spiritual environment. It wasn't like that. So for me, I just always knew that someone was beside me. It wasn't like I said, okay, please don't let me get into trouble or, oh, let's go have fun. That was not the communication I had. I just knew there was a presence with me. So do you feel that during this first NDE, this being pushed you over so you could get out from oh, under the dock. Oh, definitely. It was, it definitely, that saved me. That moved me. I mean, there was, but the, I don't want to call it a human disconnect, but for me not to panic and know that I look back on now is I always knew that they were, I knew it was the same presence that was always with me. So I felt safe and taken care of. Even though you didn't know or didn't understand it at that time, now that you're looking at it, was that like your guardian angel with you or just oh, some being? Oh, that's part of or... my spirit team. My spirit, well, as we go further, right. my spirit team to be identified for me, my spirit team are loved ones that have passed on, that are present, that I communicate with daily, that I can get direct signs from, I get physical signs. I get, um, I, I'm, I'm, I believe it's, a, and I am religious. I believe in God. I respect everybody's understanding of whatever their eternal or their sources or their continuances. I'm, I'm not, I'm not preaching one way. This is my way. I believe it's a trust that's bestowed upon me to example for others, to lift them to whatever understanding they have. Mm -hmm. So that I know. So these, this is now part of my spirit team and my guides and my angels. And I believe that this one source as I, I guess, as I got further into my journey, because I believe also that we're in different planes at the same time. Like I know that I am ascending higher to, for my soul's purpose and to be of one and however source you look at that. I understand that they have been with me and they're with me in other areas too. So I don't want to get too far off the near death right. experience in the beginning, but they're part of it. So that is a in how I identified, even though there's no 
male, female, but how I identified as he presented as a male to me. I know it is him. And I know that I have another guide. Her name is Willow. And she's been right there, like at my feet is how I call it. So, but I believe it was how I identified younger, that that was a male presence beside me. Mm -hmm. And that's a spirit guide. And they're angels, you know, they're broken down in, in what I identify with. So yes, all it's all along. And as I've stepped through my journey into my mediumship, and that's a whole nother show. I mean, if I told you how that came about, you would, you would, um, there's my squeaky chair, you would um, sit back and see how it connects. All right. Well, let's move on to the next one then. Okay. So the next one I was, oh, I was, um, 12 and a half and my sister had a horse that was almost 17 hands and so are you familiar with how tall that is that's very no. tall it's funny to me because you're in connecticut but it sounds like you grew up in texas <laughs> maybe who knows maybe a past life i don't know but um so so anyways a pony is usually like 11 hands to 12 hands to thir 13 and then you get into like a like a I don't know, a quarter horse, maybe 14 to 16 hands. Well, she had a 17 hand. It's very, so their back, you do it by the, their back, how tall their back is. It's not mm -hmm. how tall the horse. So um, I was, went to ride her horse and he was a rescue and he didn't like men. I guess he was abused by whatever, but anyhow, so we kept them down the street from us at a barn and um, the man was not friendly. I'll put it that way, who who boarded the animals. So I was on, and the horse's name, which we didn't name it, and it is, it was, its name was Satan, is what it came with. She would call him S. I don't identify that the animal was harmful mm -hmm. at all, and I don't identify that. And I don't, I believe in positive energy and to good. So, but so anyway, so I got on the horse, and he was backing up, and he wasn't listening. And so he was starting when they, are you familiar? You're familiar with horses then if you're in Nexus, right? Yeah, a little bit. So they'll curl under and they'll drop their bit so they don't have to be as controlled. So they'll try to drop. So they'll, they'll like, um, I don't know how to explain it. They'll try to roll the bit forward if they can. So that way you can't control them. And I really probably shouldn't have gotten on him, but I just wanted to ride him and she wasn't there. And so he was backing up and he wasn't listening. And the man that owned the barn came behind and he smacked him in the back, which is where their kidneys are. And the horse, you know, I mean, he shouldn't have done that. The horse reared up, I'm 13 years old, fell over backwards on top of me on ledge. When the horse reared up, I can still see it. I, I had gotten, um, cause it was, I was riding Western. So the horn, pushed in and I had gotten a bruised pancreas from they thought at Yukon Health Center when they took me. But when I went up and over, the horse was on top of me and it, they tried, do you ever see a horse on their back try to get up? They twist and they turn. You'll see their legs. That's what the horse was doing. I landed on ledged. I had that same warmth. I had that same calming. I had no pain in either of them, either of these episodes. I felt something around my head and under my back. That's all I can explain. I felt a warmth, the same warmth. And I landed on ledge. I should have been dead. Nope. Hmm. And it was that same presence with me. So, which I felt like that, I was really frightened. I was crying with that one, you know, because that was pretty, that was pretty scary for a 13 year old to have a horse rear up and, and fall backwards on top of her. And I, I remember um, feeling frightened and then calmed. Like, you know how like your mother would come over and say, it's okay, don't worry about it, and, and rub your back or something. Very, very calm. But I was crying during that one. Not a speck. I stood up after that. And then my mother actually had to drive. The guy wasn't very nice. My mother had to drive all the way from East Hampton. She was visiting someone, which is about 45, 50 minutes to get me and take me to Yukon and they not even a scratch on me, hmm. except for the saddle horn. That is amazing. And so for then, I remember, um, I remember I was so nervous and all I said was, will I be able to have children? I just remember as a child 
not thinking like a child. Do you know what I mean? And I get, the nurse was like, no, you're, it's, you're okay, honey. You're okay. And, and she's like, that's okay. And she goes, she goes, yes. And I heard many, I heard the word many. I'd never heard. And I'm like, look, I have six children. That's pretty amazing. And so that I remember as a connection um, back with that one. So with both of them, I was aware of what went on. And I felt that same presence. And after the fact, when it's happening to you, you're not like, oh, yay, my presence is, you know, or who they are is with me, because I still hadn't identified who it was, except that they were always there. So the first one I think you're saying was a male. Mm -hmm. The second one, was it the same male again? Same, 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 male. same presence, same. It didn't separate. I didn't identify more after my grandmother passed away. And I remember, well, when I was younger, before my nanny passed away, and we weren't really close, I remember my, um, a neighbor had passed away. Now, I used to ride my bike everywhere, like everywhere. And a neighbor had passed away, and I was just really curious. I was like, what is that? And I shouldn't have gone to the funeral home. I was, had no business there. But I was curious because I was driving my bike around. I went to the funeral home, and I sat in the back. And I remember there was like six people because they used to have the wakes all day. Remember they would have the wakes in the morning and then they'd have them back at night again. Do you remember that when you were younger? Is that how they did it? Well, I didn't go to any funerals when I was younger. Okay. I didn't either. So I was curious now. So I, I was drawn there for some reason, who knows why. And I remember going in, sitting in the back. And that was the first time I saw a spirit. I saw like a, and it's not like somebody sits up and goes, hi, I saw the casket open. I had never seen an open casket and people were crying and I was very respectful. I was, you know, in the corners knowing I shouldn't be seen. And I saw this, like, um, just the top part of what I saw as a shape of him sit up and come down. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I said, I'm thinking the first thing I, I thought to myself is why are they crying? He's not gone. And then I was like in my head and I'm thinking, why am I saying that? And I heard, shh, that's pretty amazing. Like I'm hearing, but I didn't understand what I heard. It wasn't the people sitting there. It was spirit speaking to me. Shh. Now I can identify what it is. So I backed out. I took a prayer card and off I went. And I didn't tell my mother I was there. And it's years. And she said, Debbie, why would you sneak in there? I said, I just, I don't know. Because I used to ride my bike. I'm just kidding you everywhere. So that but that's that communication it was starting when I look backwards. Um, I have, um, let me see what else. Uh, well, I'll just, I'll jump around a little bit. I have, I worked for the, um, the court in West Hartford and I was getting my teeth done. I had to have some caps. I had some um, implants and some root canals and a whole bunch. I had a whole bunch of work to me to be done. And I was petrified. So the, 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 my intuition is usually on spot and I don't know and I don't predict. And I, when I do readings, I never predict. I never hear. I never, um, how can I put it? I do, but I, I, I remember my ethics, which is do no harm. There's very strict ethics I follow. And how can I put this? I was the day before it was a Sunday and I looked at my husband and I said, I was petrified to have all this surgery done to my mouth. I had three little kids at the time. And, and he's like, what's the matter? I said, what if the dentist dies? He goes, what is the matter with you? <laughs> That's what he said to me. I said, I, I don't know. I said, I don't, I don't, I just heard, I, I just thought of that. This is how I put it to him. I think I said, I heard that, I thought of that. And he looks at me, he goes, what is wrong with you? Why would you say that? That afternoon, the dentist passed away in four towns over in a farming accident. He was putting his own fencing in. And he fell in the pole auger. Mm. That I was like, and at the time, again, I didn't understand what I was hearing and seeing. I didn't see the accident. I just came up with out of my mouth, like, what if he dies? Um, now I know. Now I've seen. So I think everything unfolds and the doors just open up. And as you follow through the journey of my journey, it's always been the same team beside me. I've always been, um, I call it that I'm the straw, the conduit between here and there. I think that 
open door has always been open for me to be connected more to spirit and here. And I, I'm, I'm an empath. I, I can feel, see, uh, sometimes I, I can taste, smell. Uh, it's all the clairs come through, but I believe it stems from every experience. And for this journey, this lifetime that I'm supposed to, it just feels like I'm, Remember, you know, Willy Wonka, when he gets on that boat and he, they just get, get going and it goes faster, 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 faster. Mm -hmm. And then they stop, but I don't feel I've stopped. I feel that as I go further and further, um, it's slowed down my, cause now I can understand. And it's been through trauma. It's been through loss and, um, like the, with the dentist and then a friend of ours, uh, our business partner, she passed, she had passed away. My husband passed away first. She had passed away and um, about, let's say, uh, how many months later? Eight months later, her cancer came back horrible and it was unexpected. She had been six years without it. She, and this was um, the summer after my husband had passed in December. So she, she passed away. Her husband became sick. He was a diabetic um, his whole life. Anyways, they were young. They were 48, 49. Um, so I remember going with my daughter out to eat and she had her daughter in the car, her little one, and she had to run in somewhere. She had two toddlers at the time. And I said, I just got to call Andy. I just have to call him. I said, I don't know why I want to make sure that the twins, they have twins. Like we have twins. I said, I want to make sure the boys got their Christmas, like little shirts I had sent in the mail to them. They, um, and she said, can you wait till I run in the bakery? I said, sure. No problem. She gets into the bakery door, I'm in the car with the kids and his older son texts me, it's an emergency, please call me. And he had just passed away. When Angie, his wife, I hadn't spoke to her in a couple of years because we had sold the business and they had, we had bought them out years ago and sold the business. And we would get together for like her baby shower or for my daughter's wedding shower, you know, that kind of stuff and weddings. Um, I remember thinking, she had posted something on Facebook and I was thinking about her and then I didn't hear anything. And then I thought, okay, let me get her an inspirational. I stopped into one of those, uh, I, don't, I think they sell, she sells like inspirational stuff, Bibles, um, charms, blah, blah, blah. And I went in and I just picked her up something and it said, it was like a hope bracelet and something else. And, and I texted her sister and I said, can you tell me their, their address? I said, and that's how many years it had been. Like, I just couldn't remember the zip code and I couldn't remember. I knew the street, but I didn't know the number. And she said to me, well, actually, she's in the hospital, Deb. And I said, can I visit her? And she said, yes. And let me text her. So she said, yes, you could stop by. So Brooke, who was just here, she, her and I went. She didn't make it two weeks. But that's that knowing. Do you know what I'm saying? And when she crossed, there's a whole bunch of, so I believe that this, who's always been beside me, is beside me and has been beside me my whole life. And I believe... I mean, I could go on and on and on. There's so many experiences. Um, yeah. Um, and then the the astral projection. Are you familiar with what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So doing it when I when um, unknowingly do it when I gave birth to the twins, I raised up above myself, where I was in extreme pain, um, but I raised above myself and I saw I was. I could see the top of my husband's head because he was behind me, holding me from behind, you know, giving birth. And, and I was in the operating room, even though it was, wasn't a cesarean because the 20, you know, that was years ago, they're 20, going to be 24. So they immediately put you in the operating room just in case the whole team comes. Cause I went into labor, but anyways, I could see above me. I, I, the same thing when I was, went in for surgery on my wrist, they had, um, I was out but I never really go out, but I was out and I said, I don't sleep. They, they were shaving. Cause after you go to sleep, you know, they shave what they're going to have. And I remember, cause they had me strapped down except for the arm. I pulled the arm away and said, right wrist, because I saw them doing the wrong wrist. And, and when, of course, when they wake, we woke me up, they said, um, she needs more. So I guess they gave me more anesthesia and I was out more. But I remember, and they said, you, did you have a dream? I said, yeah, you shaved my, I said, that wasn't a dream. You shaved my left wrist. So, but again, I was above, but I mm -hmm. didn't understand as, as it went.
After your NDEs, did you notice any changes? And if not, did you at least notice that the psychic door that was open opened wider? It did. It did. But let me tell you how I wasn't aware of it. Remember, I didn't understand what they were then. I was brought up in a household. My my father was a firefighter, but he was an alcoholic and he was not caring. I, I'll put it that way. He wasn't attentive. He was very ill meaning with his addiction. And it was um, not an emotionally stable, well place. So what we did as kids is we removed ourselves from there. So if it, we were outside all the time, I was in many situations, I would never let my children be in. And I've always had a knowing when to stop doing something, when to step to the side, when, and it just it started to escalate more. And I could also um, which I didn't understand manifestation. I didn't understand intent. I didn't understand any of that, but I knew when I had a positive attitude and I always came from a good place, meaning if you speak to anyone that's known me, my general nature is kind and to do for others. Uh, so, so when I began through that period of time, I graduated early um, I wasn't directed to college like I should have been. So it was one of those very unfortunate situations. When I went to college, I actually, you know, finished with like a 3.85, I think it was, or eight something. And I had three kids and worked two jobs. I mean, it was when, whenever I had a good intention or I did something positive, I was supported like crazy. So yes, I can honestly say unknowingly more and more and more happened. You're an evidential medium. What kind of evidence do you usually find that supports what you're doing? Okay. For me, an evidential psychic medium is how I identify myself. So meaning a reading, a psychic reading, are you meaning, okay, let me back up. Let me tell you how that fell opened up and then it'll probably be more understanding. So I always knew, I always could see and hear. I, um, my husband was a builder. So we'd look at a piece of property. We went to this big, Dan wanted to get there. I think it was like 40 acres. And, and in Connecticut, that's a lot of land. And so, and there were houses on there. And I remember if I stepped into somewhere, I could sense and feel. But again, I just would have an inkling. Okay. And I would be like, nope, that's not for us. Or, and I'd stepped in and I said, no, I, I don't think we want this, Dan. And he's like, okay, well, let me just talk to the realtor. He was trying to be polite. So so I went, I waited out in the truck. I couldn't even be upstairs. I couldn't breathe. So I get the physical clairs and I wasn't understanding. Are you familiar with the clairs are? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would feel pressure. I would feel short of breath. I would be uncomfortable. I would, um, so I went to the truck and he was in there for like 10 minutes and I had another meeting back at my office. And, um, I said to him, I went back in and I said, I said, excuse me, we need to get going. And so the realtor's like, well, could you just come down here? And I went down, I, I didn't want to step down. I went down and I stepped on the basement and I just, just froze. And I said, I am going back to the truck. I said, Dan, I cannot be down here. And the realtor goes, oh, I guess your wife really does sense things. He goes, there's supposed to be bodies down here from ancestors. I went, okay, thank you. We're not buying this. And I just went back up to the truck. And, and it was that sense of everything opening up. So when my husband, my husband passed away or when Pete, let me just get back to, we owned a childcare center um, and 120 children, big site. And so we'd have to 150 kids when the school ages went, the preschoolers came in, I mean, during the day. So I always could connect with everyone. I could always, the babies, I could, I could tell you who's been here before, who didn't. Um, it was, I had a, an easy, I easily connected to people and their energy. I could easily tell who was going to be positive and who wasn't. I could go into a situation. And when you say the things open up, uh, if, and everybody would say it would be confidence. I walked right into what used to be called Talon Bank when Dan needed a loan for something. We had just started out and I sat down and I left three hours later with a half a million dollar loan just mm. for, with discussing. And I knew it would be conducive. I knew that the, that this would work and I would have to present this and that. So for me, I can sense a situation. And I think that's definitely part of from when I was younger. You know what I mean? Like I knew where to be. I knew where not to be. And that's carried me through my life. So 
when someone passed away at the daycare, meaning usually a grandparent or something, I immediately could connect and I immediately could, I didn't see them, but I knew I could feel the person's energy beside them. And at the time I thought it was the grieving or, you know, just connecting because I cared for the parent because we had their child with us, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I, when I came out, as I say, of the closet, they, they are like people that have been, because we had, a, we had a lot, we had a big clientele. We sold over 10 years ago. I had so many people reach out to me in the past couple of years and say, Deb, you can't understand how much you helped me. You were spot on when you said that to me, but I was, and these are physicians, these are I mean, a lot of people. Would you, and, and there's so many wonderful things you did beyond that I just now looking back, I can definitely see, you know, how this was present and how you cared for the children and how you, in that connection. So, so that, yes. So then let me jump forward a little bit more. So my husband um, passed away suddenly. And prior to that, 16 years ago, and I didn't understand it, my oldest daughter, my grand, her grandmother passed away, my husband's mother, and they were they loved each other, but they hadn't seen, they hadn't spoken. They had like a to do. And he came from a very, um, the same environment I came from, I'll put it. And so she was older. She's my kids are at the time. My kids were, I was pregnant at 40 and I had seven year old twins. I had a 14 year old, a 16 year old and an 18 year old. They were all ours. We were married a total of 30 years when he had crossed, passed away, crossed. I don't want to say passed away, crossed. And he, um, so we, she was watching everybody except, you know, my youngest who's now who I was pregnant with. So she, and she called and we called and we checked on the kids cause it was far. We were going to the wake and she got really upset and Dan got off the phone and he goes, Brittany just said she saw my mother in the closet. Hmm. And yeah. And we were like, what? And she can see the other one here that was just here that was helping me get set up. She can see my son went through the trauma. He was only 10 when my husband passed suddenly. He did a little bit. We, we don't encourage this. This when I say I wasn't brought up with this and we don't encourage it. We embrace it. We identify it. If somebody experiences it, um, Brooks twin, definitely can connect, um, especially through electronics, spirit will come. Angie, our partner, now when Brooke and, Brooke and Shana are my twins, when the woman who passed away of cancer, my partner, I explained, she hadn't been, um, let's see, when they were little, they were how old? They were 13 when we um, sold the daycare. They were about 10 years old, nine years old when Andy and Angela, we bought them out. So, so, I would say she knew them from when she was an infant, the twins did, until they were about nine or 10 years old. They were every day with this woman in the building with me. And so when, and we were close and the kids were close because they have four boys and we had, you know, six all together, kids. We went on vacations together. So we knew one another. Well, when Angie died, it was for them very upsetting because you know it was someone they don't have aunts and uncles present in their life so that was their their extended family she was we were actually we were in this house and she came downstairs to me and she goes mom angie just i just got a message from angie and she shows me her cell phone angie's never texted her on the cell phone she turned around and she looked at it and i looked at it i said what is that and she said that's a game request for me to play i said oh Okay. So, and she also is like, she can see and she connects when my husband passed away. She had a nickname for him and Dan had bought them cell phones in December for Christmas. So they got it like a week and a half before Christmas. He passed away December 20th. So they had only had the cell phones for maybe a week, week and a half. And they were in school. It wasn't like they were on vacation. It wasn't like they were, I mean, I'm sure they were playing on their phones as much as they could. Mm -hmm. But when, after he passed away, I, we wanted to go to Virginia. The kids just, we used to go to the, the, we stayed at the, I think it was the Hilton and they liked the infinity pool. And it was just a memory. So we tried to grasp all those memories because they were 17 when he crossed. And so anyways, I couldn't find, have you been to Virginia beach? Yes. It's been, oh. a, it's been probably 20, 25 years. Okay. Been a long time for us, except for a couple, six years ago, but 
Um, there's one place you can buy an out-of-state fishing license. Are you familiar with the name of that place? No. I forgot it, but there is one place. So I had my mother with me. I had the three kids and I had um, myself, I was driving. And so I couldn't find it. And she was so upset because she wanted to connect. You know, she wanted to go there because Deanne used to always take her there and then they'd go fishing under the pier. And it was very important for her. So we're looking and we're looking. And then finally I pulled into like the 7-Eleven and Virginia Beach has, it's sort of set up, I call it, I reference it like New York, how it has the grids, you know, like it can be really affluent here. And then easily it can be a little challenging over there. Are you familiar with how that goes there? So we went to the 7-Eleven and um, I went to the other car and this man said, you need to lock them in there. You can't leave them with a car running here. I looked at him. I was like, okay. And I wasn't frightened. I mean, my mother was there, but so I went inside and I asked the, the man and he didn't speak English who worked behind the counter. And I thought, well, where is there, I can get a fishing license. She just wants to go there to buy something. And he's like, I don't know, lady. And I don't know, lady. And that's all he would say. And I get back in the car. I said, Shana, ask your phone. Because they used to have, I think it was Siri back then. I don't mm-hmm. remember what it was. And so she asked the phone and she, just, I said, just put in fishing license, Virginia Beach and see, ask what. So she asked, ask, and it comes up. Ready? Okay, Papaya. What do you think her nickname for her father is? Papaya. Papaya. Um, so that's pretty neat. Like there's tons of those that go on. My granddaughter, my husband passed away. She was six months old. She was born in June of that year. Dan passed in December. Very close, very, very close to my um, daughter, my oldest. And she would talk and babble as a baby. The night he passed away, there was obvious signs and symbols. And I could get into a whole hour discussion about that. But, and that's been consistent. He sends hearts. He sends physical hearts. Um, But anyhow, they, um, so my granddaughter would like babble when she was little and she'd laugh. You know how you hear the stories of babies are talking or Mm -hmm. such and such. She's about two years old and she's in the car seat and Brittany is videotaping her for her father to tease her. Who do you, who's your best friend? Who do you love? You know, let that, you know, new parent thing. And so she's asking, it's only the two of them in the car. And she's like, she goes, no, I'm not your best friend. And she goes, you, she goes, who's my best friend? She goes, I am. And then she goes, no, he is. And then Brittany's like, who, daddy? She's like, no, him. And so it's caught on tape. Like, you usually don't catch that. But because she was doing it to send her husband to tease him, you know, like I'm in her best friend. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really cool. And she can, so this generational, I believe, and then my aunt who passed definitely saw and spoke to spirit. Her daughter did who passed. So she passed away in her 40s, which is sad. But I know it's my grandmother because my grandmother comes through to me. When my grandmother comes through, she sends dimes. It sounds, you know, how people go, oh, it's pennies from heaven and such. And so it goes a little further. Like if you look at the date on the, the coin, when you know who it's from, that's pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I saved a man at the gym. I swim every day. And this older gentleman with Parkinson's slipped in the bathroom. He had... Um, and you're just, I believe you're placed where you're placed and, and there's a purpose and a reason why you're placed where you are. You might not understand the lesson or you might be there for someone else. So he was in the jacuzzi. I had just finished swimming my mile. I went in the jacuzzi and he went to get out and he was shaking and he's older. And he went to go to the one of the changing like shower bathroom rooms and he went in there and he didn't shut the door because he tried but he just, I guess he had to go to the bathroom so badly. So I got out of the jacuzzi and I kind of ran across and I said, do you want me to shut that? And not looking. And he said, um, please. And I shut the door without locking it. There's a reason for everything. And I didn't get back to the jacuzzi and I heard a humongous fall. And I looked at the man swimming in the pool because I wasn't going to win the, you know, the gentleman. So he, he got out and he went to go get him. And I mean, he was really hurt. So I went running upstairs in the gym i wear swim capris so it wasn't like i was flashing the world but i'm not a little girl and the phone didn't work down there and i'm thinking oh my gosh and i ran and i said somebody needs help you know he really banged his head badly and he was bleeding and so after that whole shaboogle of course they're like could you fill an accident report you know because they don't want liability and i'm like "Mm mm-hmm And so I went upstairs and I sat down and I was shaking a little bit because I was, I felt horrible for him. And I felt 
my husband beside me and my grandmother. And they sit down at this table and there's a penny. And I picked up the penny and it says 2015 on it. That's the year my husband passed away. Mm. You know, so if you put those together, so my mother flatlined had a heart attack. Anyhow, I knew they didn't call me right away. That's a different family issue, but they didn't call me right away. They called me the morning. She had it in the middle of the night. And I was removed you know, when you get bad news or frightening news. And I was running to work. And then I was like, okay. So I get in the car and Dan says, I, I don't know what hospital. They didn't tell me what hospital. There's only two in Hartford. So I said, okay. And I'm just driving on 84. And I just had this presence that everything's okay. That same warmth, but not the same as I'm injured or something like that, that same presence. And so when I got there, the family, meaning my father at the time, he and also my um, my sister and my brother were there. And we're not close at all. I've always been that little sheep that's always off to the side that's got that darker fur. And so, so I went in and I remember saying, okay. And I, I just knew it was going to be okay. And I looked to them and I said, where is she? And out walks my pediatrician's husband who saved her life. And he goes, Mrs. Freeman, your mommy's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, here comes the dimes. So my grandmother gives me dimes. So I'm walking to the intensive care. There's one in the hallway. I get by her bed. There's one under her bed. It's all the time. My husband passes away and um, his he was a diabetic, but he didn't pass from that. But he had um, his insulin in the CVS bag and you know, how they staple it. So we always had a couple of weeks ahead, I guess. I mean, he took care of it. I don't know, but there was always a bag stapled in the fridge and then he'd rotate it. And I remember after he passed away, I was so upset. And I, I was just like, well, maybe I should see if, you know, his brother could use it because his brother's a diabetic too. And he didn't take the shots. But so I opened the bag and outfilled two dimes. I mean, it, there's so many signs, symbols, reasons, mm -hmm. and it's really them connecting through. Our first Halloween, I had Cole was only... Um, he had just turned 11 and I personally, everybody that's listening is probably gonna get mad at me. I never liked the movie Beetlejuice at all. My husband would watch it with the kids all the time. And Cole, I was getting him dressed for Halloween and he's in fifth grade, so he's not little at this time. My phone is on the mantle and I'm running around getting the dogs out and doing this. Now. And all of a sudden, you know, the song that starts when I go, hey, oh, and it yeah. starts, all of a sudden it starts playing. That's very common. So all of these things are very, very common. And so that, and after Dan passed, people, I would be in the presence of people and I would know who was beside them. I was at purchasing something at TJ Maxx shortly after Dan passed. And I got up to the line and the, you know, they call you to the register with the number. They'll say register number four or register right. number three. So I knew I had to go to register number three. I just knew it. So they said, when they called it, they said, register number four, no three. Hmm. And I went to number three and the woman was standing there and I saw this boy behind her and gone like a flash, like just up, like I saw this. And she just looked at me and her hand touched my hand and I looked at her and she was, I'm so sorry. I said, no, you don't have to be sorry. And she said something to me and I looked at her, I said, I'm, I'm sorry. And she said, I can't, I'll get in trouble. She goes, I can't get upset again. I said, it's perfectly fine. And she was, she said, but my son, I said, and I, and it's wrong to say it because I hadn't learned what is proper to let out of your mouth. At that time, I didn't understand how I, what I was seeing. I wasn't giving messages or anything, but I would see people. I would feel them. I would know they were around. And I said, he's right with you. And she looked at me. I said, you're, it's fine. I said, we, it's fine. And she goes, I love him so. I said, I'm very sorry. I didn't know what else to say. Her manager came up and said, I've told you not to talk to the customers. And I said, excuse me, I'm discussing if I want to purchase that or not. Like I all of a sudden got this sense of protectiveness mm -hmm. over this woman. Mm -hmm. And I saw not his face. I saw the head like nod, like, thank you. And that, I was just like, whoa. Uh, that was, that was, so these little pieces started to happen all over. And then I thought I was going out of my mind because I missed my husband so much. I was seeing, hearing, knowing. So 
a friend of mine, she was a grandparent at the daycare and she was just always polite. I didn't know she was a Reiki master. I didn't know, you know, she didn't share, she didn't share that with me. And she had said to me, like, I'm so sorry, Dan passed. And I was typing something and I was showing the symbols we were getting and I wasn't sharing everything. I was just saying, here's this horror in, you know, like on Facebook. And um, she reached out to me and she said, Deb, I know your energy is pure. And she said, if you ever need anything, just call me. And everything you feel and say is true. Because some people would be like, Deb, don't get caught up in the, the, the grief. Grief is not something you get caught up in. Grief is something, it's a human emotion for the love that you feel and you have for someone. But you don't understand it if you haven't grieved. And so anyhow, I said to her, I just, I don't know why I did it. I just typed, typed, typed in Messenger. And I explained to her, she goes, I have to send you to this wonderful woman. I said, anything, I think I'm going out of my mind. And so I went to this woman who had like a little smorgasbord of, Here's psychometry, here's mediumship, here's uh, Reiki, here's, you know, she just had a tarot, here's everything. And I went to that weekend class and every single thing she showed us and I could do, like psychometry, so you had to take an envelope home and you had to put something in it and then you, you did, they didn't say what it was, they just numbered it and I, I could see, hear, know, and right there I left instead of feeling, oh wow, I didn't feel that way. I all of a sudden got very humbled and I all of a sudden felt very, very grateful instead of confused. And that's where that, those spirit guides and angels came in and it was starting to form and come together for me. And the more it formed, the more I understood how to help somebody else. And it just kept unfolding and it's been unfolding. Do you feel that your spirit team is your soul group and you guys keep reincarnating together over and over that i can ask that and i feel for me i okay that's a very tricky question for some and let me explain something to you i have always had people come into my path to help me okay so i'm someone that like someone will you know someone that does tarot or astrology or angels or i I have like, whoop, that's as much as I need. Whoop, that's all I need. And I, I don't dive deep into anything. It's kind of like, I feel like I'm I'm skimming on top of the water type deal. Like I put my toe here. Okay, I, oh, that's enough. I don't need to understand anymore. And I know what I need. And it's like, I feel that. So yes, I do. Do I understand it? I don't understand it as much as I understand um, what trust is bestowed. I don't consider it a gift. Do you know what I mean? Like a gift is something to me that, is given but it's for yourself i don't feel that way i feel that what i i feel i am here for a purpose and i feel part of that team more than i feel part of my earthly team so reincarnation um i believe that i believe in that but i believe some people believe or hold big strong understandings and i don't feel right here on this plane that we understand more than our human mind allows us to. If I can connect, which I do and can see, I still have to process it humanly, but I know when I can't process it, I know it's okay and there's more. At this point in your life, do you have control over seeing and hearing things and you turn it on and off or are things still happening to you spontaneously? Okay. That's, that's a big question and there's different ways in the beginning i believe like i told you like how the, all right i'm going to share something else and then you it'll answer part of it so when i started and i always go in not knowing who i'm talking to not meaning reading meaning who's come across my path to help me so so this woman so anyways so i was referred to this woman who does an online um mediumship you know, like the online bill then they offer classes and then they want you to join this they want you to join this she's never asked me to join a thing and i was referred to her and i then started to do readings online because it was it i didn't understand it at the time i physically needed to release that way because it was building up and when i say building up i don't mean spirits building up i mean 
that for me and my understanding and helping others, my human helping is what was building up. So I would sign on and all of a sudden I offer like 10 readings and a hundred people would. And then, and me just being like a deer in headlights, I didn't understand that. It, and I'm not tooting a horn that I was popular on there. You know what I mean? Because there were so many people and you'd see so many people offering or opinions and stuff. And so she sent out, and I'm not going to share her name because I believe in confidentiality, especially if a minor. She sent out a request, a private request through Messenger. I didn't know how many people she asked. I found out later. She asked, she said, a personal friend of hers, daughter was missing. And if we could meditate, and she gave us a couple pieces of information, age, female, out of the country. That's it. If we could meditate and anything came to us, we could share. And I said, okay. So I meditated, said a prayer, meditated. And I didn't get anything. I typed back, I'm terribly sorry. I, I don't, I didn't connect. I was thinking about this the whole week and I checked back and she said, okay, I'll update everyone. So she must have sent like a group thing out to all the messages. And so I got this notification. Um, she said, I, if anybody please gets anything, please reach back out to me. And then I was driving. So I'm driving, driving around. And I was thinking about her and all of a sudden, so I meditate when I swim too. I meditate away. You know, I don't believe you have to have music on in a quiet little room. I say prayers throughout the day of gratitude. Um, so I was thinking about this, this girl, which I think she was 15 years old. And all of a sudden in comes, ba -dump, ba -dump, ba -dump, ba -dump. and I thought, really? And I heard yes. And I thought, okay. And then I got that calming presence. I'll get a calming presence when I know they're helping. Okay. So I pulled into Cumberland Farms and went and got my 99 cent coffee. And then I sat in the car for a minute and I, I said, okay. And I just texted her on my phone. The following day, they found the child. I had said who she was with. I had had her alive. I had seen a street sign. It was really a park and it was in Paris. I've never been out of the United States. So for me, I, do I understand how that happened? I believe my intent was there. I believe I asked, but I definitely believe. And I saw where she was and where what she was doing. And she, the woman got back to me afterwards, but during it, so I know my team helped me. But I, again, it was in the beginning. This is a couple of years ago. I didn't understand how to have them assist. Now I will ask them. Now, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways during readings, how that works. Um, but she got back to me and she said, she's safe. They're personally grateful to you. And you're the only one that had her alive. Okay. Immediately as a mother, I'm like, oh my God, thank God. Okay. That their child is safe. And then I heard that's not the lesson. I was like, I realized it was my psychic lesson versus mediumship. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so that was, it was for me, it was for them. Of course it was, you know, I helped, but it was, that was my definite understanding what the difference is between a psychic and reading live energy, earthly energy versus energy that's passed. To me, it seems like you were almost remote viewing her. I think I did. I think I did. And then I went to a class, like there's a place in town here. And this woman is phenomenal. Again, referred to by that friend from the daycare. That was the, when we owned the childcare center, that was the grandmother. So I had that trust. You have to have trust. There's, there's a lot of people that'll tell you a bunch of bullshit. There's a lot of people that'll make money off you. There's people that'll lie. And I also understood how, I guess, fragile my human was because I miss my husband so much. We had been together since I was 17 until I was 51. He suddenly passed. We grew together. You know, we both came from, I'll say, not healthy, dysfunctional families. And we put together the best we could for our own. And we didn't, we weren't perfect by any means, but, but when, and soulmates, yes, I know he's mine. Like some people have different ideas about that too. Um, it's amazing. So then my trust, so I went to this place and I started to take just little classes and 
So I did the deep trance meditation and you have to trust. See, I feel that this is sacred. I feel I'm trusted with this. So I need to be in the presence of trust. That's what, and that's if, and so if I'm going to open myself up and I immediately will know if something's bullshit, I mean, spot on, I will know if somebody's lying. I, somebody, um, so I did the cabinetry there. I did the deep trance meditation there. And, and I was, when we were in, um, after the deep trance meditation classes, it was just four women in there. And I, you understand going inward, you understand your own energy, you understand how it blends and connects. Like everything is a stepping stone to something bigger and more. And everybody has their own journey. I don't believe you can learn how to be a medium. I believe that you expand your understanding of self and your own soul and your own energy. So after I had that basis, that foundation of, I wanna say connecting my human with my spirit soul, okay, together, I understood how that, this is just a vessel. When I understood all of that, I would understand, um, so when, when you're in the presence of somebody that's truthful and honest, you can feel it. So going further, I went to another class. I went to some like, um, I don't know, what are those when they do the sounding bowls or something like that. She did some meditation class and then she had, she has like a it, advanced mediumship where you sit down and you just share messages if you get them. And it's really interesting because a lot of people, and she has visitors from England. It was really interesting. Um, but so she, she had them there. And I remember we did like a, probably did like a 20 minute meditation prior to a different class. And this, I had this woman, she came over and I could feel her touching me, which is pretty neat. And I then went over to behind, because everybody's on like a yoga mat and you can bring your own stuff. And I was over in the corner of the room and I watched somebody else get up and move around. So I believe, you know, without knowing that I could do that, that's, that's when I gave birth, how I saw that, you know what I mean? That's, it's just, it's, it's amazing how everything layers together. So from that, then you meet other people. This other woman was very nice. Negative energy, I believe that it's a, um, for me, it's a manifestation of your human, your seeking and your intent. I do not believe, I believe, I have read so many people and through tragic loss, you know, with their loved ones sitting in front of me. Um, and I believe spirit is of one. So meaning we're all of the same, however you identify your source. So I went to this other place because I wanted to go to a widow's grieving mediumship. I'm like, okay, now I'm still grieving my husband. So I, so they had this, this gathering or something. It was like once a month they used to have it. It was in Southington. And so I drove out there and we're all around. And the speaker was a, was, um, I think it was a pastor of some church and he was an EMT also. And so he was supposed to be, well, let's just, but I, his mother came through, he, she showed me he was tending to her medically. I didn't know he was an EMT and she came through and I read him and, but I felt this heavy in my leg. But as I was reading her, meaning him, she was there. Anyways, he, this is what happened. He was supposed to be the guest speaker. He ended up really moved, you know, he was kind, but he, I brought it, his mother was brought through and I believe spirit comes with the sitter. I don't believe that I can call anybody up and say, hello, they come with, they don't, I don't have that experience or ability. Um, so when I, I, he was a paramedic, his, his mother has a, tra a tragic accident and he was called to the scene not knowing it was his mother. But during that reading in that group, it was really emotional. I, another woman, you know, I, I probably read one, two, six of the eight people there. So I was kind of like, okay, I'm supposed to be here, right? Because I'm supposed to help them, but I was looking for my own help, but okay, I'm helping somebody else again. And I wasn't disappointed. I was grateful, but I kept feeling something in my leg. And I'm like, what is that? I went back to another one. And so the owner of the building had sold the building or something. She was a, a person. And she goes, oh, I can't believe it. Thank God. She goes, oh, they were practicing satanic worship. I was like, what? So for me, I don't believe that I felt 
that energy, I felt the residual of what was there by human intent. That's how I feel that. But so I've, ne- I've never gone back. Like I won't put myself in that situation. Deborah, I'm running out of time, so I need to switch gears with you. What sure. is your, what is your website so people can find you? Okay, it's a silly one. It's not a website. It's an email because I haven't even set the website up yet. It's affirmations. It's all one word. Affirmations w hearts at gmail.com. All right. Do you have a Facebook page? Yeah, I do. It's psychic medium widow slash widowers. And I also, you can find me at Deborah Freeman. Very simple. And I'm located right in Connecticut. I have a public, they're both public. And I'm actually, my battery's low. Did you lose it? I, I lost <laughs> you, but you're back. I got you. Okay, there we go. Okay. If people just want to reach out to you and ask you questions, are you open for that? I'm open for that. They can send me an email. They can definitely send me an email. I will not, what I will not do is... I don't predict. I do not. And I know it sounds terrible. I do not give free readings. Mm -hmm. A lot of people reach out for that. And that's not my intent. And I usually do, like I have some fundraisers coming up. I'll be over at Lucky Lou's in Weathersfield in August. We're doing um, a benefit for the Ukraines. And a Ukrainian, I forget what it's called, what the connection is, because Annabella over there is setting that up. She's the owner. Um, so the, so to support the people of Ukraine, and then I'm doing, um, another, another fundraiser. That one isn't, isn't quite up yet, but I, I am in Glastonbury, Connecticut. I do a, this is what I do do, right? I give a workshop annually once a year Mm -hmm. and it's, I'm waiting until the library truthfully gets and it's through glassberry friends and neighbors it's a facebook page and i'll i have i'll put a notification up there i do a free workshop which is a lot of fun it's on energy and it's on signs and symbols and people come in and they can ask any questions it's just a really it's like a little smorgasbord it's kind of what helped me in the beginning and what to expect during a reading and and what you should say and what you shouldn't say and what you shouldn't offer and and how not to be led i think it's important to offer what I know to everyone. And so that I, I'm waiting because they read to the library. So it should be three evenings and people will have to sign up through my email anyways, but that's what I do. But, and I, I don't want to, if I, I, this is brand new to me. So I, you know, if somebody wants to reach out and they have a question, I'll be more than happy to try to help them. If I get really flooded, you know, understand that I, I, I do work and I have, you know, a lot going on, but, anything in general, I'll be more than happy to help. All right, Deborah. before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Oh, definitely. That, the, you know, everyone thinks heaven is there or wherever you say eternal. We're all of eternal energy. The veil, as they put it, they say it thins and it comes. Heaven, the veil, eternal life is all around us. Your loved ones can hear you. They can see you. They're sending you signs all the time. If you quiet your mind and understand your energy, you will easily be able to know what's best for you and you'll be able to hear. That's, that's, you know, and our purpose is on this plane earth is to help one another and love one another and to try to be there for everyone. That's really, really important. Deborah, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. I appreciate Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I so enjoyed it. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. You too. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.